Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Whales, wherever in the world you are today. Uh, so today is um, October 12th. Uh, Bitcoin's doing its little nineteen thousand uh, dollar dance, where it's just kind of hovering around, um, you know, not not doing much of anything else. It's it's going between twenty and nineteen kind of consistently. Um, around the world, there's there's you know scares of of World War Three. There is um, global energy crises, and you know there's a lot of. Um, I, I would say that overall, the news cycle is not a lot of fun right now. We're heading into midterms here in the United States. Um, but to bring this back and to put it in perspective with where we are in kind of Web3 and blockchain, um, I have just been amazed every time I talk to all the teams that are that are working on the, these problems, uh, the founders that are that are standing up new, uh, new entrepreneurial enterprises. And more than anything else, like it really showcases the fact that it is a global uh, ecosystem and asset class that we're building. Because um, around the world, we're all sharing, we're all feeling the same pain. We all share the same currencies of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum and all the rest of those. And so it really is a very unified approach when we have these conversations um, about Web3 and, and, and blockchain overall. Uh, so my guest today, and I'm really excited to have uh, Mike with Foundry, part of the DCG group, um, because they do have a very large um, kind of purview on, on where we've been, uh, where we are today, and I think a really amazing vision of where we're going. Um, but Mike, uh, before we, we dive into all that, um, would you mind giving everyone just kind of a little history of, of where you are and how you got here today? Yeah, Jay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm excited to participate in your podcast. And um, yeah, we can talk uh, all things, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining related and uh, staking related. It seems to be my life uh, these days, kind of. It's yeah. been, it's been, they, they threw you through quite a loop. You had it all set up and now you got to all the changes, proof of work to proof of stake. I'm excited oh. to dive into all that. Yes. Uh, so um, I guess a little bit on my background. Uh, I'm from Western New York, so Rochester, New York, um, which these days seems like a great place to live because we don't have hurricanes or earthquakes or fires or any natural disasters. So it's, it's like safe and secure. Um, the uh, and uh, you know I spent um, early part of my career with uh, GE actually in the leadership program back in the late '90s. And, uh, and then the back half of my career, spent a lot of time in the private equity world, essentially as a hired gun, trying to fix companies. And I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole in uh, July of 2017. So oh, I just year. hit my five year mark. Um, and it's been just a wild ride um, ever since. Um, I don't know if I could go back to the traditional world, right? Like, it's kind of a one-way trip, I think, into crypto, um, especially if you can survive a couple of the cycles. Uh, it just—it's so exciting. There's so much stuff happening, uh, and I love it. I love it. It's—we're right on the bleeding edge. I mean, we're doing stuff that nobody has ever done before, and uh, it's fun. It's fun. No, I, I love that. And let's take a second and kind of unpack a few of these things. I mean, number one, I, I love talking about being on the bleeding edge and what that really means. Um, because when, when you're kind of on, you know, the forefront of technology, there's a lot of people that are developing it, but it's, it's being used every day by mainstream um, adopters. When, when generally people refer to the bleeding edge, it, it, these are niche, you know, futurist um, concepts, which is what, you know, a lot of us in blockchain are, which is we're, we're the, we're the currency or the infrastructure, the the kind of overall um, uh, financial infrastructure uh, over the next century is what we're building. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I was in college when the internet came out, right? So the the early '90s. I remember Mosaic and and Netscape when all of a sudden you had this graphical browser, and it was mind blowing, right? And as a kid in college, it was. It was like, wow, this changes the world and there's so much opportunity. And, and quite honestly, I was too chicken to, uh, to move to Silicon Valley, right? Because that's where it seemed to be all happening. Yep. And uh, I had the same feeling when I started reading about blockchain technology five years ago. It was, it was like, wow, this fixes things that can't be fixed any other way. And I just felt like it was going to be as revolutionary as the Internet was you know 30 years ago and um it just i was like this doesn't happen very often in a lifetime right and um i gotta be honest i i got the permission from the wife i'm like i'm going all in and she's like go for it um 
And, and like I said, it's been, it's been fun. It's energizing. It's scary. Um, and the stuff we're working on is things that nobody's ever done before. Right. So, um, you know, I was, I was probably too young to really appreciate the early, early days of the internet. Right. Like Mm -hmm. when, when it was first getting, you know, set up, but, um, but that's what we're doing. I mean, we're laying the foundation, the stuff we're working on, I think in five or 10 years, will people won't even realize is, is like the backbone of, of the, the things that they're using or how they're interacting with people or how they're interacting with the government or the world or, you know, and, and we've kind of laid the foundation for all of that. And it's, and it's been happening. Yeah. And, and I really like your, your comparison to like, you know, all of a sudden here's Netscape and here's the first, like, you know, graphical browser um, that you could, you could surf the internet through and, you know, it was, everything was relatively limited, but, but people generally don't know, or didn't spend a lot of time in the, in kind of the pre, um, pre Netscape day, Netscape days when it was, you know, back of, of prodigy and CompuServe and the rest of them, yeah. when, when you actually had to dial your modem into, um, those servers. And, right. you know, if someone said, Hey, I want to host a private website, that meant that you were dialing into sometimes a server in their house. Um, in, in that perspective. And so, I mean, when you think about what we're doing today, um, with, you know, I have this wallet for this chain, I have this wallet for this chain, like it's really very similar, isn't it? Oh, completely. And, and look at back once Netscape came out, you know, and, and I was one of them, all these young kids of like, oh, we can do all this kind of stuff now in the internet. And the reality is it took decades for it to play out. Right. I mean, I, Everyone wanted to be able to watch a movie on on a device in their hand, right? And and cell phones weren't even that popular, right? <laughs> like it was, no. but it, and it took like twenty years for that to actually happen. Um, and I, I think the same thing's gonna be true in the blockchain technology. There's a lot of stuff that's uh, we're still super early on it, and um, uh, but the foundation's being laid, and that's that's the fun part. Well, let's dive right into what you're working on. Cause I, cause you know, Foundry and, and DCG group, um, I, I would say is easily one of the, if not the largest players, because you guys are, are relatively wide across the asset class. Um, a lot of people are very big in specific parts. Um, but it seems like you guys are really well balanced uh, across, um, many, many assets. Yeah. And, and, and folks that aren't familiar with DCG, maybe it'd be helpful to spend a few minutes just kind of talking about kind of yeah, please. DCG origin story and maybe the foundry origin story. Please. Um, so I guess I'll start with DCG. Our founder is Barry Silbert. Um, he was uh, a tech startup, had a company called Second Market. Um, Wall Street, you know, he's a Wall Street guy and uh, ended up selling Second Market to uh, the NASDAQ. Um, but in, two, I think it was 2012, he discovered Bitcoin. And, and really fell in love with it, basically said, I think this is the future. He placed a huge bet. Um, I think he was acquiring Bitcoin at like $8. Um, he bought a lot of it and it would have been easy to just like do nothing else, right? Like the best trade in the world would have been just buying Bitcoin, holding it, doing nothing. And he really believed in the ecosystem and the space and what it could do for the world. Um, so we started building companies around it. So DCG is not a hedge fund. It's a, it's a, um, holding company and Barry started a whole bunch of companies that people might be familiar with. So Grayscale, which is the largest asset manager in the space, um, they manage, uh, depending on the price of Bitcoin, 20 to $30 billion. Um, and he takes a 2% fee on that. Right. So it's, it's a, it's been a very big successful company. They're now suing the sec for um uh for a bitcoin etf right like that's yep. their long-term goal is to get a bitcoin uh etf good. um so grayscale is one of the, the subsidiary companies he started genesis which is the largest otc trading desk for crypto um i think their like minimum customer size is like five million dollars or something right like they're institutional based they're behind the scenes of a lot of the retail platforms. Um, and they're the largest lender in the space. They're one of the largest derivatives desks in the space. Just a big, um, big business. And, and there's a list to get, you know, access 
to, to Genesis. So even with that high number, I mean, it's, they're very popular. Um, oh yeah. 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 Like if you kind of like go to the source um, yeah. when you're dealing with Genesis and then the, uh, he bought Coindesk early on um, and, and really believed in having a, a professional um, uh, media company in the space. Right. And they invested heavily in, in Coindesk. They have a lot of trade shows like consensus is their trade show. They built out a studio. So now they're doing live programming. And Barry's bet was the next generation is not, they won't be investing in stocks. They're going to be investing in tokens. Yep. They're not going to be watching CNBC and Bloomberg. They're going to go to a place like Coindesk that is, you know, deep into the, into the ecosystem. Uh, he bought a company called Luno, which is the coin base of the developing world. So they have like mm -hmm. 10 million customers all through Africa, Indonesia, Malaysia. Um, and then Foundry, he started Foundry. And we're focused on empowering decentralized infrastructure. So we're like the engineering group, um, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake, we, we build out um, kind of all that infrastructure. And, and then the other parts of DCG, they own a lot of tokens uh, and they are probably the one of the biggest venture guys in the space, right? So they've invested in 250 plus blockchain startup companies. So you name the company and DCG is probably one of the early investors. I mean, it's really, it's an amazing organization. I'm, I feel so fortunate to be part of just this amazing uh, company. Yeah. And I, and I really, you know, again, that's why I say I kind of really applaud, you know, everything that your entire team, because this is, you know, while, while Barry is, is the guy, the man, um, overall DCG foundry and, and Coindesk and all these guys have a great reputation in the space. Um, and so that, that really comes from a good culture and that comes from a lot of, you know, wanting to see, um, the, the asset class beyond, uh, or, or grow beyond, um, just us kind of, you know, I hate to say us hobbyists, but we're kind of the nerds that just love playing with this stuff. Um, but the real utility, the real like use cases have yet to kind of appear. Um, so we're the ones just kind of laying, as you said, the, the foundation, um, to yeah, get ready what, for that next wave. Well, I've, I've been super fortunate because, um, when I started, it was just me, right? So foundry was this concept and Barry, this was 2019 and Barry had basically, he said, look at institutional money's coming into Bitcoin. They were seeing the flows come through grayscale coming through Genesis. He said, institutional money is going to flow into the mining space. Now, Bitcoin mining is like the wild, wild west, right? It's hard to know who to trust. There's a lot of scams. Um, so you have to be super careful in terms of how you navigate the industry. And uh, he just believed that, that these institutional investors were going to need somebody that they could trust to kind of hold their hands through the process. And he wanted Foundry to be that, mm. um, be that company. So he gave me a white sheet of paper and said, figure out how to leverage the DCG brand, its balance sheet, its subsidiaries, its portfolio companies, and bring value into the North American mining space. And back in that day, China really controlled um, Bitcoin mining, right? They made the machines, they had most of the hash power, and they had um, all the pools. Yeah. So they really controlled the mining stack. And we felt like that was um, one of the reasons people weren't investing in Bitcoin was the idea that China might have controlled it. So we really wanted to bust up that monopoly, um, continue to decentralize the network. Um, and that was our goal. And um, so I was fortunate because, yeah, it was a startup, but I had the biggest bank in crypto backing me. Right. So I didn't have to raise money. I could just focus on executing, building a team and. Um, trying to find ways to add value to the North American space. Um, and the other thing that was super helpful was Barry. Barry basically said, I don't care what happens this month, this quarter, this year. Think in terms of decades, right? This is, this is going to take a while to play out. So make decisions based on decades. And that really helped. It really helped us kind of navigate the industry in the space and, and have some freedom where we weren't chasing bad deals. We weren't um, being too aggressive and, and really making investments for the long term. So it's been, it's been a great, it's been, I can't believe it's been three years um, 
feels it does feel like three decades. Well, but, that, and that's crypto. Um, <laughs> we move it's, it's four and a half times uh, the speed of the traditional stock market. So really, yeah, congratulations really. on your first decade, uh, <laughs> yeah, plus, exactly. your, your first twelve years. <laughs> And uh, and and crypt and crypto with DCG, so you know you said a few things, and I really like that perspective, which is you know let's not focus on what's today and tomorrow because every every quarter there's there's a shift every every year it's an entirely different landscape, yeah. and if if I I you'd probably see the same thing I do, I see some of the most brilliant people, ten times smarter than me, I mean just as the, the giga brains like they know everything you could possibly know and they're super focused and you see these like people like raise a bunch of money and they get a team and then they go do like X, Y, Z. And I, I go, why would they do that? It's such a small idea in such a big space. You know, it's like they, they've, they've niched themselves into this and you know, whether it's six months or a year later, you know, generally I, I'm not always wrong, but you know, most of the time I'm wrong, but sometimes you, you come back and they just go, there wasn't enough of a market. There's, you know, that, right. that, that idea that, that millions of people were going to show up into a space of where 30 people a day are going into Decentraland just never appeared <laughs> because right. we're so early. Um, but really, like, can you expand a little bit on that, that concept of like, let's focus on the next few decades of this? Yeah. So at the, when we started, like when I got, when I went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, um, I gotta be honest with you, I spent like a month researching it like 15 hours a day, right? Like just reading everything I possibly could. The crypto uh, bug. I got the crypto bug, right? I couldn't stop. And uh, and then I spent a month trading. So it was like, uh, that, that was the ICO craze. And and uh, there was, a, it was great. It was a, I lived in Rochester, but there was a Buffalo blockchain startup group. And I drive every week to Buffalo um, at 8 a.m. to meet with a bunch of these young, um, you know, crypto guys. And I was the old guy in the room with a notepad writing down everything they're saying. I'd go home and I'd Google everything. I'd come back the next week with different questions. And um, so I spent a month trading and I realized I'm not a good day trader, like just not who I am. And I'm like, I want to build something. And I fell in love with the mining space. And it just felt like if this works, mining is going to be here forever and you can't do this without the infrastructure. So let me go learn that part of the industry. And I worked at a, I found a small company locally, helped them grow. Um, I think we went from like one megawatt to three megawatts, which was like this big deal in late 2017. And, and through YPO, I was in YPO, I met um, a bunch of other YPOers that were thinking the same thing, right? We're all trying to yep. do the same thing. And there's still, to this day, there's some, some, you know, dear friends of mine. We, we talk every week. Um, but uh, some of them started Core Scientific, which you've probably mm. talked to those guys. And, yep. and uh, uh, so they asked me to join Core and, um, and then, then Crypto Winter set in and it was just brutal, right? 2018, 2019, it was brutal. Um, and I helped grow them. They were, you know, they grew from like, at that point, they grew from like 25 megawatts to 100 megawatts, mm. right? Which was massive. A couple of years ago, today I think they're approaching like a gigawatt worth of of power for mining in North America. It's just the scale is so immense. Um, but and then Barry called right and said, "Hey, I want to go do this." So I don't. I I'm like, "Wow, DCG wants to get into the mining space." And when we started, it was, "Hey, take the white sheet of paper, and where can we add value?" And at the at that point in time, the miners were cash poor. So we started an equipment financing business hmm. and we said, Hey, we'll use your equipment as collateral. We'll finance your purchases because we wanted to shift the hash rate to North America. Yep. And uh, so that was our first, you know, um, big forelay into uh, mining and funny story. It was 2020 COVID just starts breaking out. Right. And, and the Barry's like, well, if you're going to do equipment financing, you better have machines. I'm like, all right. He goes, well, why don't you buy some? I'm like, well, how many do you want? He goes, I don't know. I'd buy all you can. So COVID hits, Bitcoin drops to like 3,800 and we are wiring tens of millions of dollars to China for equipment. That's not going to show up until post having. And um, Barry, Barry had only one instruction. He said, I don't want to be a Bitcoin miner. Just sell the picks and shovels to the miners. Yeah. And 
Uh, so I went around, I called everybody and pretty much everyone turned me down. Um, they said the mining economics were horrible and our interest rate was way too expensive. And, you know, so they all said no. And I had, I literally, in, by April, I had to go back to Barry and be like, hey, my great idea totally failed. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants these machines. I just bought a lot of them. And, and, you know, to his credit, he's like, yeah, plug them in. I guess we're a miner. Uh, so we plugged them in all over North America. And, you know, eight months later, everybody wanted to be in the mining space. Our equipment financing business exploded. We were a very large, if not the biggest miner um, through most of 2021. Um, but we were, we didn't, that wasn't our goal. We didn't want to be the biggest miner. We wanted to support the mining ecosystem in North America. So we were helping as many people as we could get machines, get liquidity. Um, and then the other big thing we did was we said, Hey, the, the Chinese control the mining pools. Um, and it was like mining into a, into a dark hole. You just didn't, didn't know if you could trust the results. Um, so we went down the path to launch a Bitcoin mining pool. And today we were hoping just to be in the top five. And today we are, um, and we have been for the last almost 12 months, the largest Bitcoin mining pool in the world. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So 25% of all newly minted Bitcoin flows, flows through our software um, uh, right here in Rochester, New York, which is crazy to think. Well, I, I think it's really, it's not crazy. I mean, it's, it's when you have long-term goals and you're looking at, you know, that, that idea of picks and shovels. And even if you go a little bit above that and, and say, Hey, I have to be the first you know, use case. Um, you know, infrastructure is, is what always wins. Um, you know, people can say there's a lot of people that made a ton of money in, in, you know, um, web one and web two, uh, that pales in comparison between, uh, you know, AT&T and, and Fios and all these other guys that were making, you know, a billion dollars a day, um, yeah. just, you know, weighing cable and, and, and lighting up, you know, dark, dark fiber and everything else. So it really always is, you know, if from an entrepreneurial standpoint or from an investment standpoint, like if you can get on that infrastructure standpoint, if you can own the rails, um, that's great. Have everyone build whatever they want, whatever software you want. But it seems like you guys had to kind of fill a few niches uh, along the way. Um, yeah, it was, it was not easy. I mean, it was a, you know, a lot of competition. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, we built out our staking business, right? So mm -hmm. DCG invests across the entire crypto platform and, uh, and we were investing um, on the staking side. So we're, we stake on 20 plus protocols. Um, you know, I think ETH will probably, you know, our, we'll probably be a top, top five or top three ETH staker in the world. Wow. Um, there's and there's some big staking services out there, you know, the Coinbase's and all those other guys. So that's, that's yeah, yeah. I mean, Coinbase bought Bison Trails, um, Kraken bought Staked, um, Block Damon, Figment. Like these guys, they're all great teams. Um, and that's essentially what we've built here at Foundry. So we've got 170 employees now. So the last, last 24 months has just been a wild ride. I love it. So what, let's, let's talk about, you know, uh, let's dive into some of the bigger shifts and, and, you know, we can talk Bitcoin. We'll get to that in a second, but let's talk Ethereum because, um, were you guys doing any Ethereum proof of proof of work mining? Uh, we were doing small stuff. We were not a major, um, Ethereum miner. No. What, but you know, the concept of moving from proof of work to, to proof of yeah. stake, you know, I, I feel always gets a bad rap, you know, that, that one is, is burning, you know, electricity for no purpose. Um, and the other is, is kind of leaner and has a better model. Um, I, I don't, I don't adhere to that. Those, those thoughts. I think that most Bitcoin professional miners are extremely focused on energy cost and energy supplies. Um, if the energy costs too much, it's not, you know, feasible and, and people would love to have perfectly green free energy um, that had no carbon offset in that sense. But, but from your guys' standpoint, what, what's kind of your theses on, on proof of work versus proof of stake? Uh, yeah. So the narrative it's on, it's just been unbelievable. Some of the narratives that play out in this industry and the lack of knowledge by so many in terms of how things work, right? Like it, there's, it's a common theme. I think if you go into the Bitcoin space and start learning, I know for me, like I've had to learn all kinds of topics 
that I never paid much attention to in the past. And one of them was energy and energy production, how the grid works. Um, and look at the Bitcoin, Bitcoin will always be proof of work. It'll never move the proof of stake. I mean, the thought is just kind of silly. Um, you know, anybody I think that says that just doesn't even understand what they're talking about, right? Um, Generally, yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, so you, you can it, have, it's very easy to move Bitcoin to, to proof of stake. Go ahead and wrap it and stick it on another chain. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, done, right? Like, so the energy is what gives, provides the security, right, to the Bitcoin network. Um, Bitcoin will continue to consume more electricity. What people miss is it's consuming electricity at a more efficient rate every cycle, right? The machines become more efficient um, to, on a, almost on like an exponential curve, right? Like it's just the, the next generation machine. It's incredible how much more powerful and energy efficient they are in terms of providing security to the network. Um, so it, they're not going to consume all of the electricity in the world, right? It, that's, that's not going to happen. The Bitcoin algorithm is written in such a way that it incentivized miners to find the lowest cost energy possible. So miners around the world are looking for stranded energy. They're looking for the cheapest energy they can find. The cheapest energy tends to be renewable energy, right? So hydro is probably one of the cheapest uh, energy sources we have. And miners tend to go wherever there's hydro. Um, there, we've built an enormous amount of wind and solar in this country. And a lot of times it's built and it's stranded energy. So Miners are gravitating towards, you know, wind and solar. Nuclear is um, a great energy source and probably the best energy source um, if you cared about the environment, right? And I'm so glad the narrative around nuclear energy is starting to shift. I mean, for the last 20, 30 years, it's been negative, 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 negative. I'd say in the last like five months, you can feel this turning of like, hey, nuclear maybe isn't such a bad idea. Um, and there's a lot of great material out on that. So miners, miners are, are gravitating towards um, renewable to the point of when we audit like the, the, the miners in our pool, it's almost 70% is renewable energy. Yeah. Right. Wow. So it's one of the greenest indus industries in the world. Um, and what we're finding is Bitcoin is actually in Bitcoin mining is an innovation on the, on the electrical grid for the electrical grid. Mm -hmm. So this idea of a large base load that's intermittent is a really powerful concept for energy producers and utilities. And it's amazing when and we're, we're having conversations with some of the biggest energy companies in the world. And when they start to understand that concept, they're like, wait, you can put two megawatts in a 40 foot container and you can turn it on and off at a moment's notice and nobody cares. Yep. They're, they're like, we want more of that. Right. And I think Bitcoin mining is actually going to drive more energy production, more renewable energy production um, in the future. So if you cared about the environment and uh, you should be a fan of Bitcoin mining because it's actually yeah. a really good um, efficient, uh, way to drive more energy production, um, in a yeah. way. No, no, so. I completely agree. And I, I love the fact that we're having this conversation. So please correct me on anything that I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm about to say. Um, but I think that a majority of, of journalists um, who I'm going to use when every time I see, you know, a Bitcoin, you know, mining story or proof of work story, and they're showing some kid with a closet full of GPUs, like that is like less than 1% of what's actually happening. Um, in the professional Bitcoin mining world. Um, most people don't understand that energy, a lot of the energy coming out of these, whether it's solar, whether it's nuclear, whether it's coal, doesn't matter, uh, hydro, gets lost in, in transmission or is uh, during non-peak times is just being burnt off, just not used in any way, shape or form. And, you know, that's not useful for a lot of, of data services. You can't say, hey, I want to have a hosting service for, for Netflix next to my hydro farm because it's, it's free energy because you can't shut that off. But Bitcoin, like you said, it's just, I, hey, I, I, I need my energy somewhere else right now. Let's go ahead and turn it off. The problem is we live in a society that's driven by headlines. 
And nobody wants to put in the time or energy to actually understand the topic at hand, right? And energy is one of those things you got you to gotta understand how it works, right? Like most people don't understand that the grid has to be perfectly balanced 100% of the time. And they don't even understand, like, what, they don't even know what that means, right? So you have to match energy production with energy usage perfectly. That is super hard to do. It, it's impossible. <laughs> and it's getting harder because we're adding more wind and more solar, which is an intermittent source of power. So the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And most people, when they want to, when they want to take a cold shower or a hot shower, or they want to turn on the air conditioning, or they, they want to charge their phone, they want electricity to be available right then. And, and they don't care how it got there, right? There's a whole lot that, that goes into getting that electricity to your, you know, beck and call. And, and folks just don't, they don't understand. And, and it's unfortunately, it was playing out in real time right now in Europe. And it's, it is a little frightening, you know, like, these environmentalists pushed the Europeans to a point of collapse. You know, the Germans shutting down all their nuclear power plants is was is super dangerous, right? And they're trying, they're backpedaling now and, and they're trying to like recraft the narrative and why it's okay now. And it was like, it's always been okay. You've been listening to a whole bunch of people that are that are pushing a false narrative and nobody was willing to stand up and push back. And that's what, you know, we, we set up a whole public policy team um, just to educate um, our representatives because it's like, look at this, these are complex subjects. You guys are being asked to make big decisions. You better know what, you know, you better know what you're voting on and mm -hmm. don't take this stuff lightly. This is important. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. It is, uh, you know, and just as a, as a quick note, I, I read an article a while ago that, that Bitcoin theoretically is the ability to, could be used as the ability to transfer energy um, anywhere in the world uh, to, to decrease costs. And I, I, there was a headline, I was like, I don't understand this. But what they were saying is like, go into the middle of the Gobi Desert or, or into a place where there is more sun than there ever is, you know, there, no one lives there and you can only transmit energy for so far. Um, but instead of building solar farms or wind farms around, you know, residential areas where it's absolutely terrible, um, you know, go ahead and set up a solar farm in the middle of the Sahara where no one's ever going to see it and, and have it mine Bitcoin all day long because you can wirelessly do this. You don't need a high speed, you know, fiber line or anything else. So it can sit there and just do nothing but mine Bitcoin 24, you know, as, as long as it wants and where it wants. And then taking that money and transferring it to offset, you know, some of the some of the actual power needs of the cities that are nearby or anywhere in the world. Um, and I suddenly go. Okay, that makes a little bit of sense, you know, but but again, it has nothing to do with um, being ecological or anything else it just has to do with like you can take, you know, uh, you can increase power generation and you can also decrease, um, you know, the, the carbon offsets by these things and, and still, you know, everyone can win. Yeah. And and a lot of this when I think I th what's happened to me over the last few years is. I start to question everything I read um, where in the past I didn't, right? Like I just took it like, oh, it's on the news. Therefore it must be true. And, you know, this whole idea of proof of stake versus proof of work, look at the proof of stake token holders, the people that have launched these different networks, they have spent millions of dollars funding campaigns and funding environmental groups to talk about how bad proof of work is. Right. Like make no mi mistake about it. The environmental groups didn't know anything about this until they were funded to speak out against it. Right. Um, no different than, you know, the 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 oil industry funded the campaigns 30, 40 years ago to, to shut down nuclear energy. I mean, yep. they saw what nuclear energy was going to do. And it was like, oh, this is going to be bad for us. We better start funding the campaigns to make nuclear scary and why people shouldn't want it. And we basically lost 30, 40 years of progress because somebody was driving their agenda, right? And the same thing's happening between the proof of work and, and proof of stake 
communities. Now, I think they're both gonna they're gonna coexist. They're both going to um, they they solve different problems in my mind. Mm-hmm. On the proof of stake side, there's a lot of really cool projects that solve problems that Bitcoin Network never will solve. So they're going to coexist. Um, we support a lot of them. I mean, some of the stuff that's happening is wild, and if it works, it's it's uh, it's crazy to think about. Um, but uh, but yeah, on the energy thing, it's just a it's just yeah. people kind of pushing their own. That's totally fine. You know, some of the innovations we've seen, because uh, I, I love talking about mining and I love talking about everything else. And we're seeing, again, those, those hash rates increase. We're seeing, you know, the, it went from, you know, GP, CPUs to GPUs and now to ASICs, you know, that kind of rule the world. Um, and now we're seeing another shift going from air cooled to liquid cooled. Um, and, and that is a big, you know, big differentiator when you can suddenly go, um, you, you're using less energy. Um, you can overclock quite a bit more. So there's less electronic waste, uh, as well when you're kind of building these things and, and scaling them out. Yeah. In my mind, um, immersion mining, I think is the future. And I think what it actually, the biggest benefit will be, it'll enable mining. You're, you're going to be able to mine in more locations where there's stranded power or places where you need to stabilize the grid. And I think that is going to be like the next big wave. Um, so your example of mining in the Sahara Desert with, you know, solar, it's tough to do that in air-cooled. It's much yeah. easier to do that in immersion. Um, I think having a intermittent base load is going to be important in different parts of the grid. And having big air-cooled facilities, they're loud, they're disruptive. Um, you put them in immersion and people don't even know they're there. Right. And, um, so I, I'm excited about that and kind of where that leads over the next few years. And it's definitely high on our list to, to, to push that forward. Right. Like that's, it's one of our projects. How do we, how do we go make that happen? What's your, what's, uh, what's the total size of, of Foundry? How many staff members you guys have? Uh, so we've grown to, we're about 175 right now. Yeah. So the last, <laughs> yeah. The last two years, we're a big crypto company now. Um, so it's about half proof of work, half proof of stake, maybe 60, 40 proof of stake. The, the staking side is super resource intensive in terms of people. Um, man, we, some of these engineers we have, they're so smart um, and they're so passionate, right? I love, uh, you know, it, we, we just got this an amazing team at Foundry that, that, they're like all in on decentralized infrastructure, right? Like that's, that's all they do all day. It's all they think about all night. And, um, you know, these are the kids that'll change the world. I call them kids cause they're about the same age as my kids. But, um, Believe me, I, it's the Gen Z years are coming and, and some <laughs> of the, I mean, truly they, they understand blockchain in a way that I think that those of us in Gen X just can't, um, cause we're hundred percent. We're pre-internet and they just, you know, what I, I constantly, Mia is our, our uh, chief of staff and, and she's, you know, in hundred percent Gen Z. And I constantly have to say, is this interesting to you? And, and, you know, her opinion means more than what mine would, because um, I can live in this traditional structure all day long. That's totally fine. Um, these next generation, I got a 15 year old and an 11 year old, like, they, you know, they, we, yeah. We've even seen it. Um, that there's a difference between, graduating college seniors and graduating high school seniors, just yeah. those four years, they view the world very differently. And uh, we even did an experiment this summer where we had a, a high school intern, right? And it was basically like, look at, go build something that you want because this is your world, it's not my world, this is your world. Um, so it's, it's fascinating, it's, it's it really, exciting. It's super it really exciting. Is. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot my next question to the the least sexy part of of Web three regulation. So, um, and again, whether whether there's an answer to this question or not, I'll just throw it out there. Um, so Ethereum moved from from proof of work to proof of stake, and with that move, now we're suddenly hearing from uh, the SEC and some other three letter organizations that that Ethereum, due to that move and and the way that proof of stake works, as well as these a lot of these miners are. You know, located in, in the U.S., uh, Amazon S3 is the largest um, Ethereum proof of stake miner. That now this is a security all of a sudden. Is there any is there any thoughts around kind of the way to manage these these coins and tokens um, from a re- regulatory perspective? 
Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's the answer. There we go. This Done. Is, Moving yeah, on. This is, there you go. Um, how, how do you guys feel? I mean, so this is the problem. You guys, and, and this is what I, I deal with all the time. You're, you are easily one of the smartest people in the space dealing with this. And no one can actually answer these questions. So when we're trying to build big businesses, Web1 was given all the freedom in the world to do whatever they wanted for decades. Um, you know, hey, you want to go sell stuff, you know, go sell products online? Eh, don't worry about sales tax. You just forget about that. It's not not important. You're a new asset class. Let's give you some time. Whereas, whereas with blockchain, you know, and, and Web3, like it's the reverse. Like we don't even get to use the 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 laws that are on the books, like the 1031 exchange to go from Bitcoin to rapid coin. Like, everything's taxable, everything, everything, everything. What's kind of the thesis of how do you guys like navigate that space or think about it? We hire really smart clients, people to watch every day to see what's going on. Right. I don't know. It It's going to be super challenging. Right. I think that's like navigating the regulatory space is, is tough. I mean, the stuff with tornado cash, for instance, like, holy smokes. Like, what was man, your thoughts when you saw that? Um, do we have any exposure <laughs> anywhere? Right. <laughs> like, Oh my God, what's going on? Um, I, I just, you know, part of it, part of our big focus is education, right? Like mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time trying to educate the lawmakers on what this is, how it works so they can make good decisions when it, when the time comes, um, which is super challenging, right? Like, and of course, we're advocating as much of a hands-off approach um, as possible, right? And we were lucky. I mean, look at the Google could have been invented in Russia and not in the United States, right? I'm yep. glad it was here. I think we want the blockchain technology to be built in the United States with our core values, with the idea of democracy in mind. Um, that is a it's a better solution for the world. Right. And the, the tough part is it's, it's a big threat, no different than the internet though. It's a big yep. threat to those in power. Right. And those in power have got to get comfortable with the change that's coming. Right. When, when the internet came out, it was like, Oh my God, you know, it's going to destroy the, the, the newspapers and the magazines and the TV and like anyone's going to be able to say anything they want on the internet. And, oh, you know, the world's going to come to an end. It didn't. We've, we've figured it out. Um, we're still figuring it out. Um, and I think the same thing with blockchain technology. I mean, I think it's better to take a little bit more of a hands-off approach and see kind of how it all, it all plays out. You know, the, some of the narratives are just, you know, they keep showing up of like, oh, only bad people use blockchain or Bitcoin and they're laundering money or they're, you know, doing nefarious activities. And it was like, man, that that might have been true in the first few years of Bitcoin. Look at the the richest people in the world are using it as a store of value, right? Like it's it's here to stay. Um it, it, so, and let's also be clear, this is a tiny little asset class. Like we're under a trillion dollars. Like yeah. we're, we're nothing on the global scale, but we have so much attention on us. And I don't know of any other emerging asset class that, that's as small as this, that has so much attention on it. Um, because it fundamentally but, changes the relationship between the state and the money. That, I mean, there it yeah. is. Like there's going to be a day of reckoning coming. It's, and it probably, it's not going to be pretty. Um, and, and that maybe we'll see in our lifetime, maybe we won't, but, uh, sometimes things happen faster than you expect. Right. So, you know, this whole March down this idea of CBDCs, uh, is super dangerous. Right. And I think as people start to realize what these government agencies actually want to go do, which is control how you spend your money, man, I, I would say for the majority of Americans, that is not going to sit well and they're going to look for an alternative. And Bitcoin is really the only legit alternative to, to that. So it. yeah, it's going to, it's going to be wild. <laughs> this is Get that, in this early. Is, yeah. you know, what I love about the Bitcoin network is it's, 
you know, it's available to everyone. It's an opt-in system. And the sooner you get in, the better off you'll be. If it works, Absolutely. it doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, people... Listen, it, it, as someone who bought a uh, hundred Bitcoin in, in 2001 for, or, or I'm sorry, 2010 uh, for a hundred dollars um, and threw them all away. Cause I'm like, yeah, that was really cute. I don't want to mess with these things. Um, like it, it, we are really so early. So, I mean, anyone that kind of got in like, and I don't consider myself an OG, you know, 2010, I was super early, um, yeah, but I didn't believe I, 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 it's like, how could you, there was nothing you could do with them. Yeah, there wasn't even. This is pre Mount Gox, um, is is when I just thought it was cool. It, Mike, it, really, it's it's so amazing to to see what you guys at, at Foundry DCG Group and, and kind of overall the way you're looking at this asset class. And again, we're very small. I mean, you know, less than a trillion dollars is. Uh, there's a lot of banks that are that are bigger than that. Um, a lot of financial institutions and, and people hear a trillion dollars, they think, wow, that's that's huge not on a global scale. And so, you know, I look at what you guys are doing, which is really trying to bring institutional um, value and security into the asset class. Grayscale is, is huge, massive. I, it was one of the first ways um, that I really was able to, to, to start, you know, bridging the gap between TradFi and, and DeFi. And, you know, while I've, I've since exited the, the stock market and, and do all, all natively, um, it really is important to help with that exposure and education you're talking about. That all being said, as we kind of bring it in here towards uh, towards the end, um, you see a lot of things. You hear a lot of things. You're full time in the space for for five years. Congratulations on that. Um, what's what's anything you kind of been been really excited about recently that you may have seen in the space? Oh, excited about um, scary. I would say is more you know like on the Bitcoin mining side, we go through these like, essentially four year cycles. Mm -hmm. um, some of their like boom bust cycles and we just finished a boom cycle and we're now in the bust cycle. So I think over the next, you know, 90 days, we're going to just see a lot of really negative news um, around Bitcoin mining as mm -hmm. the hash rate continues to climb, as Bitcoin price stays flat, uh, puts a lot of pressure on the miners. They got a lot of leverage. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of negative, there's going to be a lot of negative news cycle over the next 90, 120 days. And, you know, basically what you're going to hear is Bitcoin's dead. It's over. Mining is over. Um, and I, what I, what I'd say is I've, we've heard it all before, right? Like it happens every cycle and, um, it's like, yeah, here it comes. It's like the, the, the here's the, the playbook on the negative news cycle around Bitcoin. And, um, and, and I guess, I guess the inside scoop is Bitcoin's not going anywhere. Um, mining will continue to happen and it will continue to grow <laughs> over the next, uh, the next well, I think here, that so. I think that's one of the that I love that is regardless of what anyone says or whatever machine shut down, you know, Foundry is <laughs> you guys are, are here for decades. You're funded for decades. Um, you're not you're not turning anything off. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. So um, but it's going to be a wild ride. So I love it. I love it. Um, it, it real quick, uh, Mike, if anyone wants to know more about kind of Foundry or DCG group, um, you know, what's the best place to go ahead and kind of keep track of you guys? Yeah, so the website would foundrydigital.com. Um, on Twitter, uh, I'm at Collier Mike. Um, and then Foundry is at Foundry Services. Um, so, look, at, if you're in the space, you're interested in the space, I would say it, it all happens on Twitter. So you, you, better, uh, you better engage with Twitter. And, and that's, that's where you get to kind of get the inside scoop on everything that's, that's happening in the blockchain industry. Love it. Love it. Why Wills, uh, this is uh, Mike, uh, another Why Will member and, um, you know, from DCG and Foundry. And I really, again, thank you for coming by. Um, that being said, everyone, we will, uh, we'll see you next time here on Why Wills. Be good.